Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us here on our YouTube page. My name's Joe Lehman. I'm the worship and music director here at Montrose Zion United Methodist Church. And whether you're watching this in the middle of the week or on Sunday morning, we want this worship service to be our gift to you. We're going to start by doing some singing. And this is the first Sunday in Advent. So that's why I chose this first song, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Let's sing. Come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free from our fears and sins release us. Let us find our rest in Thee. Israel, strength and consolation, hope of all the earth art, dear desire of every nation, joy of I'd like to ask the Gunkelman family if they would now light the first candle in this season of Advent. Thank you. If ever there was a year we needed Advent, this is the year. You hardly know how to describe this year we have lived through. We hesitate to reflect on all the mess around us in 2020. All we know is that nothing seems right. Nothing seems like it used to be. Nothing. We need Advent. The prophet Isaiah cried out for us, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down to make your name known so that the nations might tremble at your presence. So tear through the mess, O oh Lord, and come down to us again. We long to be your people, a people of hope. We light this first candle as a sign of our hope. Hope that you can meet us, even in the mess of our world. Hope that you still see us, though we feel we are lost in the rubble. Let this light be the guide that brings us to Emmanuel once more. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Good morning and welcome to worship this morning. My name is Jennifer Dyer. I'm the Director of Youth and Young Adults here at Montrose Zion. A couple of things to remind you about this morning. The first one is if you want to order a poinsettia, those orders are due on December 6th so that we can get those ordered and here in time for Christmas. We have a couple of different ways to connect here as a community of faith. I want to make sure that you're aware of. The first one is, this is the final reminder about our incarnation study. It starts today, if you're watching this on Sunday, today at 10 a.m. So if you're not into the, in that study and would like to be, please email the office and we'll get you hooked up so that you can join that study next week. The second is we are starting check-in groups. These are groups that are going to be formed and encouraged in an intentional way to connect with people in the group. So it'll mean reaching out to a couple people once a week or once a month to just check in and see how everyone's doing. 
we're hoping to get as many people in our congregation involved in these check-in groups. So if you haven't already, please email the office and let them know that you want to be a part of the check-in group. This is a great way if you're feeling a little bit lonely during this time that we have to be physically apart. That's the last announcement that I have for, for you. Let's continue with our worship. Welcome, kids. Come on down close to your TV screens for the children's moment today. And if you happen to remember, make sure that you grab a hold of your Play-Doh and have your Play-Doh handy or your moldable clay, whatever you have, bring it with you. Today is the very first Sunday of Advent, and this is an exciting thing, and we start to mold a, a beautiful Christmas season together, and we do it in a lot of different ways. Earlier in the service, we went over here and we lit our Advent candle, and so I'm hoping maybe if you've got a candle at home, you lit a candle for yourself. But today, we're going to talk all about, and we're going to sing some songs that help to mold our hearts, and today we're going to talk literally all about what it means to mold something. And so go ahead and get your Play-Doh in your hand. And I've got three special challenges for each of us to do. We're going to take 30 seconds to create three different things with our own two hands. All right, kids, get ready. Okay, kids, if you've got your Play-Doh ready for our first challenge this morning, what I want you to do is to take your Play-Doh and in 30 seconds create a flower. On your mark, get set and go oh boy oh boy we're working our way through this creativity process Two seconds and done. Okay, how did everybody's flower go? Oh my gosh. I can tell yours, those are beautiful. Those are some beautiful creations. Very good. And I bet you everybody's creations, hold them up to the TV. I don't know if I'll be able to see them, but man, I would love to. And so for our next creation, we've got another 30 seconds that we're working on. Get, go ahead and smush it up with your own hands. And like a potter, with our own two hands, we're going to create something brand new. And so for your next challenge, in 30 seconds, create a horse. Create a horse. On your mark, get set, go. Oh boy. Here we go. your horse down oh there goes my horse come on horse stand up for me oh dear oh mine's a person playing horse okay <laughs> nice job everybody oh mine's a rocking horse like you put on the ground he doesn't even need legs right? oh so i like that back and forth right now that's creative i like that a lot joe okay kids everybody at home for our final challenge this morning is to take this bit of play-doh or your clay and with your own two hands I want you to mold a brand new vase. Make a vase. And on your mark, get set, go. Awesome. Nice job, everybody. Gosh, I would love to see everybody's creations. And Jen and Joe, I love your beautiful vases. Fantastic. Nice job. Kids, I absolutely love the things that you molded together with me. 
And by playing with Play-Doh is awfully a lot of fun. But I want to ask you a question. What do you do if, do you ever leave your Play-Doh out a little bit too long? Does anybody know what happens to that Play-Doh if you leave it out? How many of you know? Oftentimes when I leave my Play-Doh out, it starts to dry up and then it gets hard. And I try to mold it and all it does is it falls and it crumbles to pieces and I can't create anything new with it at all. Now the prophet Isaiah a long time ago was talking about the way in which God molds each of us. You see, we believe that God created each and every one of us and molded us into a beautiful, awesome creation. Now part of who we are supposed to be in Advent is to remain moldable, kind of like this Play-Doh. I can mold it into whatever I want it to be because God is trying to mold our hearts into a very happy and beautiful way. You see, we mold our hearts through the lighting of the candles in which we welcome Jesus. We mold our hearts by singing Christmas carols and preparing our hearts to receive Jesus. We decorate our sanctuary just like you see it today. And perhaps you decorate at home, putting up Christmas lights and putting up Christmas trees. All of these things, what we're doing is we're molding ourselves and we're preparing ourselves to receive and to celebrate Jesus' birthday. And so kids, what we want to remember is we don't want to become that dried up old piece of Play-Doh that can't be molded anymore. Because each year God is molding my heart to make me ready to be able to celebrate Jesus' birthday. And I need to be able to keep my heart like this piece of Play-Doh, able for God's loving hands to continue to mold it. So let's continue to pray and let's continue to celebrate and we'll worship Jesus Christ in these upcoming weeks and then celebrate his awesome birthday on Christmas morning. Kids, let's go to prayer. Dear Lord, keep us soft and moldable. Let our hearts be molded to love you. We prepare, Lord, by lighting candles, by turning on lights, by decorating trees. But mostly, Lord, we prepare a special room within our hearts to receive you. Amen. Our first scripture reading for today comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 64, verses 1 through 3. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood, and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. As we come into this time of prayers of joys and concerns, I have one joy I would like to lift up this morning. We as a faith community have collected 102 boxes for the Operation Christmas Child. I want to say thank you to all of you out there who took the time to donate a box, fill the box with love and prayers. You've really made a child's Christmas a little brighter this season. With that in mind, let's go to a time of silent prayer. Merciful and patient God, how we must try your patience. We rush through the seasons of our lives as though we've had a mighty schedule to keep. We plot out our days minute by minute, crowding each moment with tasks, stresses, and pressures. We begin to notice the growing darkness and anxiety in our lives. We proclaim boldly each year that we will not let ourselves get so caught up in the commercial pressures and demands, and yet, here we are, back in the same old trap of not enough time, not enough energy. The very plans we weave become bonds which imprison us. Help us to bind ourselves to you, loving God. Help us to slow down, reflect on the many ways in which you bless us. Let us drink deeply of your peace. Remind us again of the most precious gift of all, the gift of re loving relationship between you and your creation. May we cherish the people and the peaceful moments you offer to us. As we have lifted before you our joys and concerns, 
So lift our spirits to remember that you are always with us, offering your healing touch and your compassionate care. Help us to place our trust in you, almighty God, as we begin this season of Advent. Remind us again that in the midst of our darkness, you, bring, you are bringing us peace to calm our anxious spirits and hectic lives. Turn our hearts again towards you. Make us ready to receive your Son, our Savior. Slow our pace and give us the blessing of feeling your peace in our spirits. We ask this in Jesus' precious name, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Hi friends, during this time of offering, I want to remind you about a couple of the mission opportunities we have going on right now at the church. The first one is the table I'm standing in front of. We're collecting for Urban Vision, which is a mission that serves the North Hill Akron area. They serve mostly immigrant families. So what we're collecting here are paper towels, toilet paper, laundry detergent, and towels and washcloths. One easy way to do this is to buy online and have it shipped directly to the, store, to the church. That way you don't even have to leave your house to donate to Urban Vision. The other mission opportunity that we have is we're also collecting for the Midwest Mission Distribution Center. This is a center that's connected with the United Methodist Church. There's a whole list of all sorts of things that they're asking for um, in your newsletter. So check that out. Some of them include simple board games, jump ropes, balls of any kind, pumps to inflate the balls, um, and then anything for the um, health kits like we've put together in the past here at the church. So check your newsletter for a more detailed list, and I thank you for always being faithful in your giving. Our second scripture reading comes from the book of Mark, chapter 13, verses 24 through 37 the coming of the Son of Man. But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds, with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels, and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. The Lesson of the Fig Tree From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. The necessity for watchfulness. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Neither the angels in heaven nor the sun but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey, when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cock crow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all. Keep awake. Friends, our staff started envisioning our Advent uh, sermon series probably way back in the summer of 2019. And back in the summer of 2019, we had no idea the turmoil that would come in the following year in 2020 with the political strife, with the social strife, with the disease, with the, the world shut down, with all of the disconnection and the despair that has happened. We just didn't see it coming. But what was in our hearts back in the summer of 2019 is still as what beats in our hearts today, which is the desire to return to what is familiar, and particularly in a time period in which everything feels new, to go back to what is tried and true, to go back to what is trustworthy. And so over these upcoming weeks, what we wanted to do is to focus each Sunday on one of our favorite um, Christmas carols that we've sung throughout the years. And this week we're studying, and we're going to be looking into, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. You see, the singing of Christmas carols for me is able to, it, 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 something powerful happens within me. It helps me to elevate myself above whatever chaos um, is, or mess is happening in my life today. And for many of us, when we sing these carols together, it takes us back into powerful memories of the past, of more peaceful times in our lives. Or perhaps these songs have the power to project us into a future and a vision of better days yet to come. But no matter what, whenever I sing these carols, they tend to be some of the happiest songs that I sing throughout the entire year. And they've captured me with a degree of excitement ever since I was little. When I was a little boy, I remember putting on my Christmas clip-on tie and preparing to, for Christmas Eve services at Mayfield United Methodist Church. I would gather with other kids my age, and together we would sing these carols to a congregation um, in a darkened sanctuary on Christmas Eve. And I remember being so absolutely excited about that as a child. 
Friends, I want to be able to reclaim that same sort of excitement for all of us in this coming season. It's that kind of excitement that brings things to life. And the excitement I experienced back then as a child had so much more to do than, than simply with a bunch of presents that I know I would find under my tree the next morning. The excitement I felt as a child was a great deal. It had to do with the far part that I realized that I was a part of something that was really big. It was so much bigger than me. I was a part of something that was important. And every time still that I sing these hymns with all of you, I sing them and I realize I'm a part of something that is so purely and eternally alive. And so we sing these songs together. Now we all know that Christmas is coming. It comes as no surprise. The calendar rolls around every year. December 25th arrives just on exactly the day it's supposed to. It's no surprise. But then I ask myself, why is it then? If it's not a surprise, if I know it's coming, then why is it then every time I sing these songs, these Christmas carols, then my heart is moved in such a powerful way that it brings me to tears? Or why am I brought to tears on a Christmas Eve night when we raise our candles together and we sing Silent Night, ushering in the birth of our Savior? Friends, the answer is simple. But the word we use for the experience is not. The word that we use to capture that experience is the numinous. It means that God has moved closer to us. And in this Advent season, God is with us. Emmanuel. O come, O come, Emmanuel. God moves closer. And as we believe, as we feel our Savior moving closer to us, our hearts and our lives are moved in both powerful and energetic ways. That Christ is truly born anew every year when we make room within ourselves to receive him. And so what will we do with these upcoming weeks of expectation? Well, frankly, it's up to us. But as for me, I will keep watch. And I will look for my heart to be both wounded and healed all in the very same moment. And I'll keep my eyes attuned to the light of hope that is growing, the light that will give me an idea and the assurance that Jesus Christ is born, our Savior is coming. And so, O come, O come, Emmanuel. It may not come as any surprise at all for those of you who study hymns that O Come, O Come, Emmanuel is probably the oldest of all of the Christmas carols that we sing. It dates all the way back to the 12th century or even perhaps before. And I can just picture in my mind a bunch of medieval monks chanting this song as they move together, chanting it together in Latin as they move through their monastery. Veni, veni, Emmanuel, O Come, O Come, God be with us. The monks would chant this at the end of the day. As the sun was dipping down below the horizon and night was falling, they would chant, O come, O come, God be with us. But the expectation that we sing of in the song, the expectation of Advent, is so much older than the thousand of years that we have been singing this song together as Christians. And we remember our shared history in the lyrics of this beautiful hymn. We remember a shared history of God's people when we were taken away from our homes, taken to live in a land that we didn't want to, exiled up into Babylon, unable to see people who are most dear to our hearts. We recall our shared history as God's people when we wandered homeless, homeless, with no law to guide us, only hopelessness and chaos. Within the lyrics of this beautiful hymn, we recall our shared history, a day in which death was victorious a day in which death held sway over our thoughts and gripped our lives in its indifferent grip. But by faith and through the expectation of our coming Savior, we look for a time to be set free to truly come alive in Christ's name. Through this hymn, we celebrate a time in which we are set free from the grip of death to be able to be set free to no longer be defined by death and disease, but instead to be defined in our rejoicing the rejoicing that we do over the order that Christ brings, the rejoicing that we have over the eternal life that is one in his name. And so we rejoice. And so who were these monks that sung this hymn so long ago? Friends, to be completely honest with you, we, we have no clue. We have no idea exactly who the author was, but we are not clueless about what the world looked like in the time period in which this hymn was written. And so I look back through history and I looked at the 12th century to see what was going on at that time period, the same time when the monks were penning, O come, O come, Emmanuel. In the 12th century, 
It was a century ravaged by war. It was the first years in which the very first crusades were launched to the Middle East. And so the Middle East was ravaged by war. In the 12th century, people were beginning to move from one continent to the next more. And so with the influx and the changing over of people, disease was spreading across the face of the earth. Here in our modern day United States, there was a great famine that struck all of North America. As a matter of fact, it was so bad that the southwestern part of the United States, and particularly the area of Arizona, was so struck that it was almost completely depopulated. In the 12th century, wars were raging also in Japan. And a little boy was born in Mongolia who would come to be known as Genghis Khan, as were his dreams to go and conquer the world. In medieval Europe during the 12th century, political mobs were moving through the streets, kicking in the doors of people and dragging them to trial just for daring to disagree. And so I think about the time period in which this hymn was written, I realize it was a mess, just like our, our own time period is a mess. But I'm reminded that the words of the monks wrote in that hymn, O come, O come, Emmanuel, have faith, have hope, God is with us. And so friends, what are your expectations for this coming season? I like to pride myself on being a pragmatist. I like to believe in a practical theology that not only do we have a theology that we think of with our minds, but we can put it into motion in the world to love each other um, in a very uh, tangible ways. I believe in a practicality that I have around my finances. But also what I've discovered about myself over the last couple of months is there's a bit of pessimism that is creeping into my life, and I don't like it. And so what are my expectations for the coming year? Well, I expect that day by day I will grow older. I expect that my already achy body will probably be a little more achy by the end of next year. I expect that there will be challenges that will be coming in the months ahead that I cannot possibly foresee today. And for many people, they think that the world is ultimately going to fall apart. But I really don't want to see myself get swept up into a wave of pessimism. And so what do I do? Friends, my answer is simple. I resist it. By faith, I resist. As did the monks who wrote this hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. The world they lived in was defiled by war and by people who were hungry for power. But in the midst of the wars that raged around them, they wrote these words and they sang these songs to a homeless, vulnerable little child that is born to be our Savior. And they made it their mission to keep their eyes attuned, seeking signs of hope, signs of life in the midst of chaos. And friends, they are there too. Looking back through the history of the 12th century, I've come to realize that not everything was bad back in the 12th century, though we often get our eyes turned, our eyes often turn to the most explosive things happening in life, like the wars happening. But back in the 12th century, the very first bound books were made and also being mass produced because of the invention of movable print, the printing. Um, that happened in Northern Asia. During the 12th century, Oxford University opened its doors to its very first students. Also in the 12th century, a little town named Timbuktu was established. Now Timbuktu is a very dark and horrible history. It has a, its history put a scar on the face of the earth for centuries to come. You see, Timbuktu was established in the 12th century as a center for all of the African trade industry, or the slave industry. Now, I think about that on one hand, but what often gets missed was that there was a little island nation in the northern Atlantic, also in the 12th century, that just as slavery was being ramped up in Africa, a little island nation in the North Atlantic known as Iceland made it their decision, a moral decision, to ban and abolish slavery forever, becoming the first nation to ever do so. Friends, there were good things happening in the 12th century also. It's just up to us to look for those things. And so what are the signs of hope in coming, the coming of Christ that catch our attention and capture our hearts in these upcoming weeks? Because friends, over this past year, I think we've been kind of conditioned to look for, or to be conditioned to overlook some of that good that's happening around us. Every time I gather with my, my children, and I sit down and I've been having lengthy conversations with them, and I hear about how engaged they are, how connected that they are to the world around them, it gives me a great deal of hope. And I know that there are better days ahead for all of us. 
Friends, what are the signs of life and the signs of hope, the twinkling of the lights and the glimmering of the candles that you see in your life? As Christians, we are called not to be lulled into a place of complacency nor despair, for Christ is coming, and it is the love of Jesus Christ that has the power to pierce through even the most darkest of realities. And so, friends, let's make it our mission to keep our hearts open to new possibilities. And let's keep the expectation alive that we sing about in O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, an expectation that the monks first sang, sung about nearly a thousand years ago, and an expectation that continues on in our lives, that if Jesus Christ is God with us, Emmanuel, God with us, then we need to live that way, no longer overwhelmed by the despair that we experience, but rather lifted up, by the light of hope that is coming. So let's keep awake. Let's look for signs of life and know that Jesus Christ is coming. Our Savior will be born. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Amen. That mourns in lowly exile here until the Son of God appear. shall come to thee, O Israel. O come thou wisdom
Dear friends, at this time of year, each day grows gradually darker, but there is a light that is shining, a star that is shining is guiding us to a manger and is guiding us to the place where our Savior will be born. So friends, keep our eyes attuned to that light, to the light of hope that is ever growing, and go in peace. And may God's richest blessings be with you now and forevermore. Amen.